teaching by um, the fact that the work that I do day to day is to train people. Um, we have a grant from, or several grants from the Department of Justice focused on getting best practices into core programs, predominantly diversion programs for uh, folks who come into the legal system with mental health and substance use issues. Because, funnily enough, we needed a lot of research to realize this, that jail or prison is not a great place to recover from a mental health crisis or a substance use disorder. Uh, that's why we invented treatment. So that's, that's what um, our work is really focused on, keeping folks with, or helping programs keep folks with substance use issues in their communities attached to treatment um, and resolve their legal issues without incarcerating. So, um, with that, that, there is some research, obviously, in best practices. And I think that part of that um, focus on best practices for one area of the legal system has helped me think a lot about best practices in teaching generally. I think when you're attuned to what is a best practice over here, that means you can ask questions about. Um, their practice elsewhere. Uh, so I've been um, a frequent consumer of CTRL programs over the last couple of years. Um, I have tried to go as many as I can, and I think I've learned a lot about best practices in teaching, which I hope that my students experience. But the other piece um, of our project is we, we are trying to understand how to get best practices into court settings. Unsurprisingly, not every court setting looks exactly the same. Not every court is staffed with people who are interested in best practices. And I've met some gnarly 90 year old judges. A lot of them are not super interested in learning what the latest research on something is. They are interested in how long they can keep going before they help to retire. Um, so, a lot of our research is how do we take these very densely academically written, no shade, well, a little bit of shade for people that wrote them because they are dense and academically written. They read like an academic journal, it's just 200 pages long. Uh, how do we turn that into something that I can go to a court and I can say, here are the things you need to do. Here is what you need to do. Here is what you need to change. And those are doable. Um, there's not a lot of good showing up for a program and saying, the one thing you really need to do is rebuild your entire building. Cool, we're not going to do that. That's not happening. So what do we do? How do we, how do we use these uh, best practices to move programs forward? And as I've been thinking about sort of that translational research piece, that plays into teaching too. Skills that you need in training and communicating best practices that look very similar to the skills that you need that you use in talking to students. And I think as I've become more confident as a teacher and as a trainer, the ability to teach classes has really helped me in thinking about how do I train better, which informs how do I teach better, and create this own translational research project on what worked, what didn't, where did this work, where didn't it work. So the, those are the two of the things that are sort of directly related to my day job. I think there are two other pieces that I just want to touch on very briefly. One is that I think one of the advantages of being an adjunct, you know, research at a university, is your research doesn't necessarily have to perfectly align with the research goals of the department. Some departments have very clear research strategies. Uh, JLC is a little more varied. There are folks working on a variety of things. But my particular area of expertise fits into the department perfectly, but I don't need to have a whole research stream that the department is funding to be interested in. I can show up, I can bring this little piece of expertise to the students. And I think it's really important for our students to know that they're being taught by people who know what they're talking about, that they're being taught by people who have an area of expertise. It doesn't need to be, you know, there are folks in JLC that work on policing. That is a broad area of expertise um, that covers a lot. But being able to say, I know about this issue, I know about how to keep people with substance use issues out of the legal system, that is something that is interesting to students and has value and merit to them. Being taught by an expert, and I think that's a really important piece. The final thing I'm going to say, and I will hand it over to Daniel, is a lot of our work focuses on, yeah, surprise no one, the legal system is rife with structural, systemic, and direct racism. Uh, so a lot of our work is focused on how do we make these diversion programs serve people of color? Because people of color are more likely to be arrested, they're more likely to end up in jail, they're more likely to end up in court. The one place they're not more likely to end up, diversion programs. So we're trying to understand how that happens. And I think that helps a lot with working with our, our student population as well, as we try and you know, we're trying to think about diversity on campus. We're trying to think about who's coming to our classes, who has access to these things. But some of the things that Chuck mentioned at the very beginning, why do all the adjunct faculty who have time on their hands look like this? Why do 
why 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 do our students look at the what they do? Why are folks of colour not sticking around at AU? Part of it is probably because it's a pretty white campus. I mean, how do we think about that? So a lot of the work that I've done on reducing or hoping to help courts reduce disparities applies to that teaching as well. How do we think about some of those disparities in our classroom? How do we approach diversity and inclusion in a way that benefits our students, benefits the research community, and ultimately makes for a more just society? And I will leave it there. And we'll play musical chairs. <laughs> Thank you for having got it. I could see the screen from there. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at the audience. I guess. So welcome everyone and thank you to Chuck for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Daniel Ginsberg. I use the pronouns. I am an adjunct professor and lecturer in the Department of World Languages and Cultures. Um, prior to that, a few years ago, I was in the anthropology department of anthropology and feminism. Um, both of those, I think of myself as being, an, I would say, an avocational academic, uh, because I do have a full-time job outside of the university, where I'm currently a director of strategic initiatives at the American Anthropological Association. For the last, there's a recent change for me. Prior to that, for four years, I was director of education and professional practice. Uh, and so a lot of what we were just talking about, or what Matthew was just talking about, really resonated with me about how the experience that I have professionally is something that I can bring into the classroom to take something that we're talking about that might be kind of theoretical, or in the case of anthropology, it might be very geographically distant and culturally distant, and make it immediate. Uh, so, um, for example, I've done a fair amount of work, I mean, thinking about how my work aligns with the research goals of my department. World languages and cultures, a lot of the research that people are doing is about language pedagogy. And so for me, thinking about, you know, I've done a little bit of work in clinical pedagogy, thinking about um, different kinds of uh, participatory education, democratic education models. And so being able to do that in my classroom fits in really well with the, the thrust of what people are talking about, about bringing students in and not just having it be, you know, you come in for a couple of hours while I talk to you. Um, I think really that's more of a stereotype than a reality in most fields these days, but uh, the extent to which people are engaged with it actively varies. Uh, but also in my, in my regular work, I do a fair amount of informal and non-formal education. And so when I say informal and non-formal, informal would be something like a, a webinar series or a museum exhibition design or a workshop where there are people who just come in for one event. When I say non-formal, I think of something where it's not a course for credit, but I have a relationship with my students that goes over some period of time or participants, if they're not, whether we call it students or not. Um, so that could be something like uh, interns. I worked with, with undergraduate as well as high school interns uh, uh, on a variety of things, including you know developing educational materials. And so being able to provide this experience and having some sense from meeting also faculty here to know how that might connect with what they're doing or for the high school students, what they might be preparing for. High school teachers like to scare their students by telling them what it will be like in college. There's varying levels and accuracy. Um, but yeah, having having been there and being able to talk to them and all of the learning would be valuable just to be able to translate this back and forth. Um, all of that said, the sort of headline of this session is about research. Whether any of that counts as research is hard to say. Um, but if I think about the last time that I was published in a peer-reviewed journal, uh, because that's a question of the research, <laughs> it was for a, a project that I did, again, sort of in a non-formal education space, where I worked with teams of undergraduate student researchers from five different schools who were all doing ethnographic or mixed methods research on the question, if you're majoring in anthropology, how do you prepare for your next step action? Because you know, a lot of people are asking, um, and I thought who better to look for answers. Um, so I was, there was a pedagogical engagement for me with my research team. And what I would really like to do, and I guess to the, to the point of this uh, session, it's very hypothetical because I would love to be able to take what my research team learns and bring it into the classroom and work with new students who are struggling with that question. You know, on the one hand, on a descriptive level, to say what the questions you're asking, 
not just you, people around the country and around the world in our discipline are asking the same question, and they're finding answers that you might not have expected. Here are some examples, right? And some of it also is the process of it. And I can say, having worked with the research team, and also with my interest in clinical pedagogy, I'm thinking about how do I think about, you know, none of the students in my class is going to follow the same career path as one of the students from my research team. Processes the same. And research itself also being a process, they can learn how to do that research themselves. They can investigate their own future careers. And especially for those of us in liberal arts students, where you know there's reason to believe, and there's other research that I have done, since the 2008 financial crisis, if your field doesn't sound like a job, I mean, the quotation marks in my fingers, then enrollments have been falling, right? In fields that do sound more like a job, the effect has been different. Um, and when I say sounds like a job, even economic sounds like free business, so that trend has been different. Um, but the question that I guess for me as an adjunct faculty member is how do I make that visible to the people who could pair me with students? I don't know if it's in my chair to know that I have this to offer, to be able to put me in this kind of a, of a setting where it could really be a benefit to the students and to the department. And to the discipline. Um, and yeah, I think it's And yeah, and then I think also sort of in a, in a along the same lines of why we expect tenure faculty. I think by me staying engaged in teaching in that way, it also benefits me going back to my primary work. And I do a lot of you know faculty development and academic relations there. And to say not just like I can offer you this, but also I'm kind of there also. The more connections we can make, I think it strengthens on both sides if we can figure out how to do it practically. So we're all here, we're all doing the work. How do we build the bridges? Um, maybe Pat next. If, uh, can we hear Pat? I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Q and A at the end, or are we saving questions to the end? Are y'all gonna like tell us? I, I, that's up to you guys, I guess. Uh, if we have, I think we have. Let me check the time. We have enough time. Yeah, well, I mean, if you, I mean, if you got questions, yeah. Yeah. Hi, y'all. Thanks for being here. I teach strategies and stress management, and it feels almost selfish the amount of data that I'm collecting from my students, from their reports to their presentations. I have to do something with this. It's just, it's too good and I feel like I'm holding on to like a treasure chest. So my thinking right now, and it's, I want to know like an actual step. You have all this great, good stuff you're rocking with in class. We have our full-time jobs. I run a business. Lots going on. Where did you start? What was the first step to take this great data and put this into something that could turn into research, where you didn't feel overwhelmed and stretched too thin. I teach strategies in stress management. I will not stress myself about trying to figure this out, but I can't keep this to myself. How I'm doing it now is I open up the semester, literally with just data pulled directly from my students' papers and showing my students in front of me, this is what students took away. This is what the big questions they asked. This is what they're learning. But I need this to become more formalized. What was the first step you did? Before, before we start, before we start, can people online hear the question? I see the thumbs up. Okay, I can revoice if you need to because I'm sitting closest to the webcam. Could you turn that into a class that's designed to take that with your students, take that data, and turn it into a publishable piece of research? And that's where I need to know where to start. Like that's why I'm curious. How did you all? If this is something you have, you were in the same kind of, not a predicament, it's actually a good place to be in. Where did you start with that? One thing you might want to consider is IRP, the Institutional Review Board, because okay. if you're going to use data from your students not for teaching purposes, yeah. it's federally regulated, like the ethics and everything. Okay. So I would just talk to them first yeah. and early, because they would be able to uh, make sure that you're doing everything in a way that's not illegal. And that's like just an on-campus office? Yes. IRB. I don't work with them personally here. Okay. I work with, did more research at my previous institution. Okay. But that's the big thing for human centered research is, yeah. and they would be able to connect you with the people on campus to help. And both PRLs, in other words, right? 
I know nothing, but I'm also teaching strategies of stress management. Oh, wonderful. Are you Benitez? I'm Benitez, Benitez. yeah. Benitez. Coco Benitez. 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 Nice to meet you. I've read your syllabus. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. What's your name? I'm Susan Comfort. I'm oh, Susan. Oh, and Comfort. So, how ironic. I know, right? Name. But my point is that I don't know the first thing about how to answer your question, but I would love to coordinate with you because I think there are five sections of our class. Okay. And if there's something that all of the instructors can sort of gather in a similar way, or you know, maybe there is something that together, yeah. five sections of the class that we can do, because this is really real time, very real data that's going to keep changing, and it's probably not IRBable, it's probably not publishable, it's not peer reviewed, but it could be very interesting information. So let's let's try. Okay. But that does not answer your question. But I just want to chat some more about it. So anyone that has info or Helpful things. Great. I see a hand up online also. Mac. Mac, go ahead. Hi, folks. Hi. Um, my name is Matt Crate. I work uh, at the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am the person who helps faculty who are doing what we call scholarship of teaching and learning projects. So these are projects exactly like what you're talking about, uh, Coach Coco and uh, Susan. So if you all want to reach out to me, um, feel free. My name is Mac Kreit. My email is m. C R I T E at uh, American.edu. So I just Thank want to give Mac. That support. Appreciate that, Mac. I've been to a few of your sessions. You're always very helpful. Thank you so much. I can say, I'm not sure if my experience is quite the same as what you're talking about, where I wasn't teaching a class and I had students who were working with me just as, as researchers. Yeah. But the way that that program was designed is that they would be authors of the papers that we published. They would be authors of the papers. Okay. Yeah. And so that was the, the thing was structured with the, the concept that what my the students I was working with, I won't say my students because I wasn't their professor, um, that it was research and that they were doing the research. Um, and that the main pedagogical goal that I had for them was to think of themselves as researchers. Yeah. And so seeing their names in the journal, it's like there it is, you can't deny it. Um, uh, career launcher course that I was sort of spitballing to you all five minutes ago, it's structured in a similar kind of way, where hypothetically, it's not a course that I've taught, but I'd like to have students do their own research on possible careers that they might be interested in, maybe do some informational interviewing and some of the sort of groundwork around it to learn what that is about, how to get it, write it up, and then we could make it who we are, right? Where it would say, here's a case study of user experience research written by so-and-so who profiled these people. And so that's, you know, sort of beginning with that in mind. It's a different sort of a process to like, if I've been teaching this for a while and I realize that what my students are doing, like again, with the IRB, it may or may not be practically doable, but then if you're gonna teach this stuff again, you can think about like from the beginning, how do I work with them? Can I add something on just since I have y'all's attention? Anybody that's an adjunct, we're stretched for time. And if, we, if I could just devote all of this and my energy there's just the money's just not there. So, how did you all? Did any, have you, any of you ever written a grant for research and there was money behind it so that you could actually focus some of your time and energy on going hardcore with the research? Have you, any of you had that experience? So the program that I described, my time was paid for out of my salary. So you wrote that into the grant, like that no, was no, a no. part of the. Project. My time was paid for out of my salary from my full-time job. Oh, gotcha. But the research expenses yeah. were paid for by a grant. That's where my mind's going next. Um, I can Is that something, Mac, that y'all help with too? Mac, do y'all help with like, I know I heard the word scholarship, but where there's money behind it so that we can both teach, continue to run our businesses, and get money to do this research? So there is a scholarship of teaching and learning fellows program where we offer adjunct or term faculty uh, that support in both time, so my time, uh, in helping with those projects as well as funding for those projects. Um, I would suggest reaching out to the Office of uh, Institutional Research for help with grant funding, um, but I also know Patrick uh, was about to speak, so uh, go ahead, Patrick. Thank you, Matt. Um, can you all hear me okay here? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. I'm the fourth one who would be with you uh, if I didn't have a deliverable at five o'clock, that would do. Um, so I'm with you in all of that, in that there is a lot of 
expectations associated with adjuncting. There's a lot of different things that we're doing at the same time. I wear about four different hats. I'm a historian by trade. Uh, I'm a community-based historian. I work in Mount Pleasant, live in Mount Pleasant, and I've been doing Mount Pleasant history, specifically the history of Spanish-speaking populations in the DC area and immigration history. Uh, so I'm a community-based historian and an oral historian. Uh, yet, one cannot support oneself on the adjunct alone, as you mentioned. Uh, so I also serve as editor of Washington History Magazine, which comes out bi-yearly, bi-annually. It's a peer-reviewed magazine of everything DC history, published by the DC History Center. And I also teach at Georgetown University and at Georgetown Day School as well, all DC history or immigration history focused. Um, to your question on funding, I think if universities really want their adjuncts to be able to do research seriously, they have to pay them a living wage. And right now, AU doesn't. Um, by comparison, when I teach at Georgetown, I get paid $10,000 per class. AU pays, I want to say, $4,300 maybe with our, our most recent bump. And so the university isn't making an investment in its adjunct faculty and allowing its adjunct faculty to do research. Um, I do my research over the summer, in the summer months, but I also have to self-fund that research. I use that funding, I apply for humanities grants from Humanities DC, right, DC Humanities, but that's only because I'm in the humanities and I know that's available. Um, but there's no, I, I've seen very little, if any, university um, opportunities, either at AU or at Georgetown, to apply for grants for, for adjuncts. Most of, the, most of the grants, with a few exceptions, say you must be a tenure track professor or associate, well, tenure track, tenured, or you know, adjunct associate, or I'm sorry, associate assistant to be able to apply. Um, so yes, it's lovely research. Research is a luxury for adjuncts. Um, and most of us don't have the time. If we do, we do it during the summer. Thank you. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add, Pat, or do you want to, uh, that I think was pretty complete, but uh, if not, then I'll run through a couple of things that I do. Nope, that was that was it. That was my, my intro and awesome. my <laughs> That intro. is perfect. That was beautiful. Uh, so uh, I, uh, and I think it's, and it's, and it's absolutely right on, and it, I, I appreciate that you think of, and this is like, uh, to think of research as a luxury, uh, like, yes, it gets treated as a luxury. I also think research is fundamentally part of how we teach, uh, or, you know, it, or it can be fundamentally part of how we teach. It. Different faculty will teach in different ways, and I don't mean to say that every faculty member has to, you know, have a research agenda in order to be a good faculty member. I don't think that's, I don't think that's the case. Um, but uh, I do think that research can be, can really be integral to, you know, not sort of uh, you know, not something where we learn content and stay current in our fields and we take that content as, as like some separate entity that we then pass on to students in a different, totally different format, but that the research and the teaching are actually, are actually to go together. Um, I teach, uh, one of these courses that I often teach is a Habits of Mind course. It's, an, it's basically an intro to anthropology in the U.S. Uh, course, uh, and it's... Um, where I teach it as you can say, the course is focused on inequality in the U.S. I teach it as an intro to anthropology course with the topic of inequality in, in the U.S. as a sort of uh, a way to get into that. Uh, and I teach a lot of methods in that course. I teach, you know, ethnographic field writing notes, uh, ethnographic analysis. Uh, I, I encourage students to sort of learn through experience, uh, you know, and I don't always have them focus their experiences on it, have them focus on inequality for ethical reasons as they're doing these field those things, uh, field those projects. I have them think about other, you know, other other areas because this takes some of the heat off of the off of the project if they're if they're writing about their acapella group or something like that. That actually gets them to think about how to take ethnographic field those in a way that doesn't put quite as much pressure on the on the situation. Um, I, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm teaching them to see through it. I'm teaching them a method. I'm teaching them a way of, of thinking, and that's the way of, you know, and that's the way of thinking through, that I do in my own research. Uh, you know, and so I'm not teaching them, uh, and I'm also teaching them how 
how anthropologists produce knowledge. Uh, and I use that term, and I know I'm not sure if my students say this at the beginning of the semester. They definitely don't get it. Some of them get it at the end of the semester. Uh, you know, I, I teach them how anthropologists produce knowledge and how the knowledge that anthropologists produce is different from the knowledge that uh, sociologists produce or economists produce or, uh, you know, other, uh, other disciplines produce. Um, so just to um, uh, throw out, um, so, you know, for instance, when we teach, when I do these, uh, just a couple of quick examples. Uh, when I teach students, uh, when we do field notes assignments, I want them to be thinking about the ethics of representing other people uh, in writing. Nobody ever sees, nobody aside from me ever sees the field notes that they produce. They're not producing these as a research product or anything like that. But there are implications of how to deal with, uh, how you deal with the, you know, the ethics of writing about somebody and writing down, a, down an event in which people were, were there. And so I, you know, as somebody who does that, uh, and does that on a routine basis, and is you know engaged in those ethical questions in and of themselves. That's part of what I what I'm thinking about, and having that experience uh, and being able to share that with them helps them understand uh, you know how I might be able to do that. Another example: um, if I want to show, we do sometimes do peer review assignments. So if I'm interested in how students and how anthropologists or academics in general produce knowledge, and how that's different from for instance how journalists produce knowledge. We'll talk about peer reviews, and I will show them a peer review I'll project on the screen. I'll project a pre peer review letter that I've gotten that says, you know, uh, and then I can talk about how, you know, peer reviewer three, who really loved the piece, didn't actually help me that much because they didn't give me any really good feedback. And peer reviewer four, who peer reviewer two, who <laughs> like, hated it, and totally misread it, actually gave me the really helpful piece of feedback that was like, oh, hey, this is where they misunderstood that. And I can and I can help, and that, that helps them understand what it is you might get out of a peer review. Why do we give critical feedback? Why do we tell them, hey, this is where your paper needs to be better? Because if we just tell them their paper's great, there's nothing to work with there. And it also tell it also helps them understand how you know how we make our research better by uh, you know by critiquing each other by critiquing each other's work. Uh, and last example, um, I. Taught a, an SIS, I taught a race and ethnicity across the Americas course. I set aside the last unit. I had a like I had a backup plan, but I set aside the last unit. I said, "You guys propose to me a unit that you want to that you want to teach on. You want me to teach on I mean, any topic within race and ethnicity across the Americas." Uh, most of my work is in Latin America, and so uh, you know there was that was sort of a large part of the focus. And they wanted to work on uh, First Nations and Indigenous communities in Canada, uh, and so we did. Uh, you know, that was a, that they proposed it. They sent me some texts to work with. I took those texts and I, you know, uh, picked some others, took some of them and picked some others and built the, you know, two or three weeks of syllabus around that. And that was actually amazingly helpful for my own research because they were pointing to me texts. They were pointing out to me texts that were related to my research on settler colonialism, particularly uh, in a different part of the world that I would not have engaged with if I had not had this course. That was helpful to them because, you know, since we're doing something that's new research for me, new reading for me, we're all reading it together. We're all talking about it together. We're all discussing it together. And it's much richer for them to be, you know, engaged in the process of co-learning uh, than, than it is to be me telling them, telling them what to do. Uh, so in all of those ways, those are all sort of examples of where my research and my teaching aren't actually sort of separate tracks where, you know, they're happening on different, uh, on different, you know, in different times, on different timelines, with different, you know, with different, you know, uh, accounted for in different ways in my, in my, in my time. They're all happening together at the same time. Uh, that is what, uh, you know, that was sort of my own experience with this. Uh, um, and I think with that, I want to have a conversation, really, and that's, uh, I hope, uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to do a quick plug from the library perspective. My name is Vicki Mersh, and I work in the library. And for both you as faculty and as out of AU professionals, you have access to such a wealth of research and resources and librarians to help you and your students dig through it. Do not hesitate to reach out to the library as a partner in your work. Um, it doesn't matter that you are adjunct or all the different levels you mentioned, which I can't rename. Um, it is a resource for you, and we like to work in partnership with you. I just to follow up on that, actually, because I know um, a lot of, in my, in my full-time job, a lot of our members have left academia 
and the one thing that they miss is access to the libraries. And they come to us and they say, can you help me find an academic library that will let me in? And I guess by me having this adjunct position here, I'm privileged to have access to everything that you provide. But I know it's also an expense, right, to keep all of these adjuncts and various people who are you know, not full-time faculty having access to that. I want to think about how we make it worth your while. So that the research that I might be doing in my full-time job can be somehow affiliated with AU, and that you can show the benefit of the expense that you put into paying for people like me to have all of the journals and databases. But one short answer is to reach out to Rachel Forshat, the faculty scholarship librarian. It, it is relevant to our US News and World Report ranking and other rankings. So that sort of identity matters in the scholarship world. Um, I don't know the metrics as well as Rachel does, but uh, she's a pleasure to work with. So don't have that. And should we be reading, like if we publish something, should we reach out to her and let her know that we published it, or will, that, or will she track that automatically? Complicated answer. Uh, some of the databases will see you as American University, depending on how you register your research and you register your ORCID ID. Um, most of it is not automatic. Reach out to Rachel <laughs> or to me, and I'll introduce you to Rachel. Hi, I'm Winfield. Um, I teach in the School of Public Affairs. Uh, I've been doing it for almost 10 years now. Um, I wanted to offer two sort of uh, items. One is um, I was lucky to apply for a small grant or essentially a reimbursement to attend a conference. And it was one that I had been to actually as a student here at AU. And then I decided I was going to go to try to publish a real paper. I, I think I checked the box that says take it as a paper or take it as a poster. And I got the poster. And I was like, whatever, I got my foot on the door. Uh, and I went to this conference. I had paid for a data set that I had used in the particular um, offering that I put in the poster. And when I got there, I had like two or three people talk to me. I sat there for two hours during this conference, you know, the poster sessions. It's a little lonely sometimes. But I had one person come up to me, and they wanted to collaborate with me. And it was like a great validation of one that <clears throat> <laughs> and two, that um, there are other ways to leverage your position as an adjunct faculty, as a researcher, as someone who's found the data, spent a little money of my own, it was my own dime. Um, but then that kind of, you know, out, looking a little bit outside of the box and being creative. So I offered that. And I had another nugget, but I can't remember. Is that, thank you for that. Is that a good foot in the door? Like if we're talking, you know, based on, you know, I really appreciate Pat's realistic perspective, but is that a good place to start? Like, this university funding for us to at least go to conferences? There is one thing I will, there is, as part of the, um, part of the contract, part of the union contract, okay. and the, from the very beginning of the union contract, there is a very small uh, amount of money that adjunct faculty can apply for. You have to apply to, not very well advertised, uh, but you can, uh, it's a professional, it's called Professional Development Fund, the Adjunct Professional Development Fund, okay. managed by Bill Leo Grand, but you tell your chair you want, you want to apply for it, you can use that money uh, to pay for anything related to research, anything related to professional development, if there's a, if there's a, uh, a certificate or a, or a credential that you need, you can use it for that. It's a, it's a $700 a year cap, okay. so it's not tons per, of money. Per, per, no. per adjunct. So I went to, I've been to two different conferences on this same thing. And, you know, the truth is, I don't have the bandwidth mm -hmm. or the travel time to be able to go to more than maybe one a year. Mm -hmm. um, it's fallen off a little bit recently, but, you know, my goal was actually to go to some of the same yeah. conferences. But it's, it's at least something, you know. I didn't even think about that. That's such a great idea. Yeah. AU credentials do get you, like AU has funding databases as well, um, yep. and it's, a lot of them are, you know, you've got to go to an institution, some of them you can apply for privately, um, and they're not, again, they're not massive, but some of them are, you know, if you need $5,000 to analyze your data, yep. that might be enough to say, hey, you know what, and the one thing I would say, um, I am a PI on a grant from AU, is that AU takes a lot of your money, if you apply for a 
through AU, they will take 43% of the stock um, So if you can avoid it, particularly as a small amount, and you don't need the grant management from AU, okay. leverage your academic position within the university, but leverage private because AU will take it. Is that what you all found most helpful using, you know, our title and what we do here at AU, and then going after more private private things? Is that what you all would recommend? Is another good. I see Pat shaking his head. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Unless it's huge, you know, if it's half a million dollars, then you want to go into it. <laughs> yes, <okay. laughs> Until they all, they give us a raise, right? Yeah. 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 That was a joke. I can tell. Oh, yeah. I guess no one else caught on to that <laughs> one. We did get an extra hundred dollars last time. Last time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
you know, I think that some of the models of, you know, other professional opportunities, um, you know, what else is happening in your department? Are there folks in your department who are doing support that's similar to that? Yeah. No, I, okay. I, I'm similar in that I'm a staff and adjunct. Okay. So my department is also not exactly within my discipline. Um, I've, I've done research in the area too. But. What about other universities or places that, like other researchers, where yeah, they would have? More like advice on trying to build those collaborations when you don't have something that you can really bring to the table other than your skills. You don't have an RA, you don't have the space to do data collection or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the problem. You know, that's, I think, and it, it, one of the things that I hope happens out of here is sort of like, oh, hey, this is really, like, there, there's, there's a handful of us in here kind of right now, but I'm hoping that this is like, you know, like, The middle of or part of a conversation that's happening not just you know amongst us here but also that this is uh, and one of the reasons why like i think it's actually important to have it on the program and in, in in the fair conference is that you know like hey we are you know we as adjuncts ought to be doing research because it makes us better teachers uh you know not just because it's you know not just because we think research is fun but also because it makes us better teachers and if you want us to do good work teaching uh, and, you know, find opportunities for us to, uh, you know, for us to, to, to do that research. And that's, you know, a conversation with, you know, department schools uh, and the university at large uh, and academia at large, too. This is not, you know, uh, AU is within, you know, within the department, you know, within, within the academia. That, you know, within, uh, but, you know, I, I think it's important to recognize that your research actually is part of what makes you uh, what makes you a good teacher and finding ways for you to keep doing that research actually isn't, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a luxury, it's not a, you know, it's not an incidental part of your, of your teaching, it's actually, you know, elemental and critical to your teaching. Things that, I don't know if this is true for STEM as much as it is for the Department of Justice, but you can do peer review on grants. That again, the pay is pretty pathetic. But in terms of connections of the people you might be working with, the conversation you might be having, I don't know, like HHS or NSF has that similar thing. But the DOJ, you just sign up with your expertise in, and every now and again, like Gordy would say, there's a horribly written grant, tell us what you think. Because I think DOJ gives you a whole $200 per application. Most of you are with an HHS. Yeah, well, to review an article, yeah. But it's sort of like ironic for reviewing this grant, but like this is going to cost two million dollars. It's two hundred dollars to see if you think it's good or not. But it's again, it's not great and it's you know it's not super reliable. But in terms of just being in the room with other people, and it is. <laughs> Sorry, I, I do find that I hear you know I like to have I go pretty deep with my students and they share quite a bit, and I'm I do find a lot of them with the recurring theme that they can tell when their teachers are here for research. And when I hear feedback from them, thank you for listening. They, I mean, it's almost like I'm an op, like they're being an obligation to me by sharing and us having this moment in office hours because they're just like, shouldn't there be some paper you're reviewing or some research? Am I really that important? So it's this, I have, it's a both and here at AU. I feel this energy of push to research, but we focus on teaching and that is not what my students are telling me. They're being met with cold responses when they're dealing with real life stuff, a death in the family a serious breakup that's impacting their health. And they're just being like, hit with the board of someone who could give to you know what, because they're focused on their research. So I, I, I really want to keep that top of mind as I both explore. I can't imagine doing it without them involved in it. That's why I love that authoring piece. I think that's quite special. But also remember, I'm here to teach. Like I am here to teach. This is my gift from God. This is what I do well. This is what I'm here for. So. It's just I'm getting conflicting. I'm, and I hear, I listen from my students, honestly, before I listen to adults. I do hear what my students are telling me because they're the ones moving and grooving when the bell rings, going class to class. And they're feeling that this is more of a research institution and that they're getting less of the teaching that they really are craving. Um, I just got to please wrap up uh, sign. So unless there's any other like really pressing, urgent questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I really appreciate the conversation. Patrick, you have 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Get it in. Good luck, Good luck Tyler. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'll need, I'll need all of your help. Evaluation. Back in the chat is saying, please take a few moments to fill out our evaluation survey. We love your feedback and use it to improve our program. So there is a link in the chat for those of you online. For people in the room, there's tiny pieces of paper. Yeah, I think you all received an evaluation. People have a here. If you, if anyone needs a pen, there is a pen here, and if anyone needs extra, there are 